um hello everyone welcome to the 126 stanford media group exchange and this week we have with us mihir parmar who is a phd student at arizona state university and he's also a research associate with mio clinic he'll be talking about his research on the role of instruction tuning and prompt engineering in the clinical domain his research has been published in top tier NLP conferences such as ACL, EMNLP, NACL, and EACL. And he also received the Outstanding Paper Award at EACL 2023. His work uh, focuses mostly on pioneering instruction tuning in the biomedical domain, analyzing the impact of various instructions on model performance and exploring an LLM's capability to, uh, to do question decomposition, program synthesis, and reasoning. Additionally, also has industry experience working as a research scientist intern at Adobe Research as well as Novartis. Mihi, thank you so much for joining us today. And before you start, do you have any preferences on how you would like to take the questions? Do you want to take them uh, while you're making the presentation or you want to keep like uh, keep them till the end of the presentation? Yeah, so uh, if anyone has some questions in between, I'm happy to answer in between. So. Okay. More of a, like a discussion style uh, yes. people yeah. want. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, if at the end they want to have an extended discussion, I'm happy uh, okay. to do that as well. Awesome. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's try to make this uh, session as interactive as possible. And let me hand it over to Mikesh. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, Okay, uh, my screen is visible, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, hi, uh, thank you for a nice introduction, uh, Avisha. Uh, yeah, so a uh, bit about uh, me is my research interests are uh, mainly instruction tuning, reasoning, self-improvement of LLM, developing state-of-the-art LLMs and uh, prompt engineering at some extent. Uh, during during my PhD, I also had a good time collaborating with uh, many of the industry people and uh, fortunate to do internships at the uh, good places. So today, mainly I'm going to talk about um, uh, how we have started instruction tuning in the biomedical domain and as well as like uh, uh, I'll start my presentation by giving about some idea about instruction tuning, prompt engineering, and trends in NLP. And after that, we'll move to uh, especially application of instruction tuning in the biomedical, where we talk, uh, we'll talk about one of my work um, on applying instruction tuning in uh, many biomedical and clinical tasks. So let me uh, very first begin with paradigm shift in NLP. So from 2021, there is a whole field change drastically when people have introduced LLMs. Before to solve any NLP task, you have to create a label data. Now, after creating a label data, you have to do the fine tuning. After doing a fine tuning, you do evaluation. The problem at that time was like, it's uh, not very generalizable to uh, OD, out of domain data, as well as, you know, like when you, when a new task comes, there is a need of creating a data set. But point is after this uh, uh, GPT-3 kind of big models have been introduced. So the key component was there is when you scale up the model and train on the lot of data, these models are able to understand the language. In a certain way, you just give a prompt, meaning that you just give a uh, any OD out of domain task to it. And at some extent, they are able to do it. Every time it might not to be a very efficient, but yes, they are able to understand and do some jobs. So here is like a song. Uh, a very nice animated figure that shows that, you know, there is only a, a different prompt, one model, and like it produces like a different outputs for a different type of task, like summarization, fill in the blanks, some question answering, uh, all, all those kind of things. So how, how what, what exactly enabled this prompt paradigm shift, as I said, right? When you sc scale the model, you train on a billions of tokens and you produces the final model, that model has a very good understanding about language. And that understanding actually um, uh, make them unable to understand a new task and solve them. And the objective behind this pre-training was the next word prediction. Though, so very basic thing they do is 
it's a very simple pattern matching algorithm where you give a sequence from their understanding they try to predict the next word in the best possible way which have uh, apparently happened to be uh, solving a, a, a task for example you know you say recite the first law of robotics it's able to do it you say okay uh, create a button that looks like a watermelon now with this multimodal model it's able to do it it's able to produce the code it's able to do all the different kind of thing a single model without having a having any training any task specific training just giving a good prompt you are able to do uh, do a fantastic job uh, on solving any task so here there are two things were happening from this point one is prompt engineering how you can make the best possible prompts to steer the model to do a good job on a uh, specific task. And even there are some paradigm people are exploring or researchers were exploring saying, okay, what kind of alignment I can do to make the uh, model better? And uh, I'm gonna touch base on those things as well. So then the large language models come into the pictures. We started with a very small model, 94 million model, which is the first LM ever built language model. And then we reached to 540 billion in a span of two years. And these models are able to solve many tasks that uh, before only exclusive to humans. Now they are, these models are able to understand the language in a better way. They are able to solve some task in a better way. They are able to do the reasonings in a better way. They are able to uh, do the domain generalization in a better way. Even some of the simple clinical or medical task they are able to do with a good, good accuracy. So with this increasing parameter, the, the uh, set of tasks that we are solving is also increasing. Before it was just a few tasks, you increase the parameter, you scale the model, more tasks, you scale more model. It's like physics, scientific discovery. There are many, many tasks that this language models are solving uh, at, at this point. And now it is like uh, um, before there are many tasks like logical reasoning. We are very exclusive to human. And if you want to solve it, we are exclusive to neurosymbolic approaches. But with this language understanding, even these models are at some extent able to do a logical reasoning kind of task that uh, similar to what we uh, human can uh, human can do, especially. But even with this LLMs, there are few things that this LLMs are still not able to do that efficiently. So there are many incentives for building a better LLMs. So what are those incentives? One, we want to boost stability. So we want to enable better control over model outputs. We want to steer the model in such a way so that we can produce the output that we want, especially in the domain uh, uh, domain specific task, especially when I talk about a clinical task, what kind of model, uh, what kind of output this model generate, uh, it, uh, it depends a lot on if uh, physicians or clinicians are ready to use the model on. So you want a better stability, you want a better model that can generate an output that a certain set of uh, users uh, want to see, certain set of users appreciate. Another incentive is you want to improve instruction following. This models are very good, but sometime you give a prompt, they're not able to follow your prompt in a very proper way and they make mistake. And you don't want those models to do that. So the one more incentive is you want to improve the instruction following of this model, which essentially enhance their accuracy in even responding the complex prompts or understanding a complex information that you can give into the prompt. There are other things like you want to broaden a task generalization. So you nowadays, the thing is with building this scaled model, like uh, with the billions of parameters, we are building a lot of, lot of LLMs there and many, many LLMs are coming out. The thing is you want, don't want to build a very task specific model that contains billions of parameters and they are very, very hard hard to uh, get into the real uh, real world and use in uh, basically um, uh, like very hard to deploy. So you want a model that has a broad task of generalization. So you can use a single model to solve many of your tasks effectively. You want to minimize your fine tuning. You, know, you, want to want, you don't want to annotate a data. Even with this LLMs to do some task specific uh, 
uh, some task, uh, you have to create a task specific label data to align this LLMs to produce the better output for this task. Now, and at the end, you want to align with the human intentions because you want you don't want model to deviate too much from its behavior. If you have created a model for the clinical domain, you want the model to behave in the clinical domain and produces the output in a certain way. If it's a patient front model, you want output more relevant to the patient. If it's a clinician or physician front model, you want more better output from the uh, physician or clinician, uh, uh, how, how they speak in their terminology. So you want to align with the, what's your user status. What are the people that are going to use this LLMs? So now pre-training only can't do that. So pre-training only cannot boost the stability. It cannot improve. Pre-training is just give them understanding of the language. And because of this understanding, default, they are able to solve many, many tasks at the hand. Even the simpler tasks, they are able to achieve far better performance than the, any smaller language model can um, uh, achieve. So, but to give them a stability, to broaden the task generalization, you want something on top of these models that can improve their, their this kind of behavior. And that's where the methods like instruction tuning comes into the picture. Instruction tuning are, is kind of a one alignment method where you align the model to follow the different kind of instructions. So instruction tuning is basically a step after the uh, pre-training. Pre so basically the, you first pre-train the model it's simple like BERT, T5, whatever model you use. Nowadays, it's GPT-3. You pre-train the model. Uh, initially, you are fine-tuning on task, and then you are doing inference. So with GPT-3, you pre-train the model, you do prompting, and then you improve the performance. But instruction tuning is a further step. So you have a pre-trained language model, which is <laughs> every kind of language model. You build an instruction tune model on top of it where you have you collect a lot of instruction tuning tasks where you can decide a specific task that you want your model to tune for. So basically you say there are a lot of lot of clinical tasks you can gather with instruction and then you further fine tune the pre-trained model on this instruction tune model and basically it produces the final uh, instruction model that's able to follow the clinical instruction in a better way. So instruction tuning is, you can see, as an alignment algorithm that's able to steer the model in a certain way so that those model, those pretend models are able to understand the certain domain-specific instructions in a better way. It could be clinical domain, it could be reasoning domain, it could be general domain, it could be anything whatever task specific things you wanted it to do uh, or whatever domain you want the model to adapt in you just create a large instruction tune data set and then you create a model on top of it so I there have are a couple a lot of questions of... me yeah. yeah sorry sorry to so during pre training do you for when you are pre training a model which you pl plan on making making it a more instruction tuned model do you also kind of uh, uh, kind of inject instructions in through the pre pre training data set or is it just a solely like separate instruction tuning data set that you instruction tune the model on or is some insta specific instructions also there when you are pre-training the model? Uh -huh, no. So pre-training, so this is, uh, this is a good question, actually. So during the pre-training, there is a, uh, the objective of optimization is the next word prediction. So yes. you give a, uh, give a set of words and you say, what could be the possible next uh, word that you can uh, yeah. produce? And you optimize the model on that objective, right? Yes. In instruction tuning, it's basically the data is a set of instruction, your input, and then your output. So yes. it's basically optimizing your model on different objective. Yeah. So for to answer your question, for the instruction tune data, it is a separate tuning that happens okay. after the uh, pre-training. Pre-training. The instructions the... are not the part of the pre-training. Okay. The, the other... Way... 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Please yeah. complete. The, yeah. the way instruction tune model uh, created is a different objective function than the pre-training in nutshell. Okay. I have another question. So uh, when we are doing the next word prediction, these are essentially all these generative models, right? Yes. Is scan instruction tuning be applied for a model like, uh, say, BERT, B-E-R-T, BERT, or B-A-R-T, BART? BART is yeah. like an encoder-decoder model. And then B-E-R-T essentially doesn't do next word prediction. It's more like a class prediction or like a classification model. So do you think instruction tuning can be applied to any of those kind of models? Yeah. So I think uh, to answer this question, it's a two-part answer, actually. Yes. Yeah. You have um, uh, raised this question. So there are three types of models. Encoder mm -hmm. models, encoder-decoder models, and yes. or decoder-only models. Yeah. Where encoder-decoder model has a different pre-training objective, and yeah. decoder-only model has a different pre-training objective. Yeah. But the key common um, uh, component between encoder, decoder, and decoder models, both of them are generative models because yes. at the end, you are generating a text. Yes. They're text-to-text -text models. Yes. So it is very easy to apply the instruction tuning over encoder, decoder, or decoder-only models. Yes. But for the encoder-only models, there you can apply the instruction tuning, but you need to have a specific task choices. Okay. Yeah. So uh, even on the board, you apply the instruction tuning and you have a generative task. You want a decoder on top of it. It could be a different decoder. Yeah. But essentially, then it becomes an encoder-decoder pipeline. Yeah. Essentially, but, it becomes yeah. like that. If yeah. it's a classification task, you can optimize. If all are the classification tasks, you can able to optimize board even with the instruction tuning. Because... Yes. At the end, in the instruction tuning, it's an input-output pair. Okay. And also, uh, it's good that you raised this question because uh, I'm going to talk about the first model we built, uh, instruction tune model we built in biomedical domain, that's inbox BART. And yeah. it it's an encoder-decoder model. Yeah, it's yeah. a BART-based model. Yeah, BART so, yeah. Uh, yeah, after that, there are many models came. There are decoder-only model. So, uh, yeah, so... To further go ahead, I can even show you some of the... So, me impact. before you move, I have one quick question. So, yeah. I still don't really understand the, the difference between the how you call instruction tuning versus self-supervised super, fine-tuning. Yeah. So, basically, supervised fine... So, instruction tuning is a kind of a supervised fine-tuning. Right. So, why do you call it like instruction tuning? Because I would think like if you create the instruction tune like instruction set and the corresponding answer is kind of like supervised fine tuning. Yeah, but uh, the key objective in the instruction tuning is you want model to understand the, understand the, inst so basically if you create a supervised uh, tune model with the fine tuning, that could be a very specific, a very task specific model. But when you instruction tune the model, when you create a lot of instruction and then you tune the model, on these instruction, then these models are also able to generalize to the unseen. I, I think we can we can say the same for the self supervised model also, right? Like if the supervised task is variant enough, so we can actually use that supervised model for other tasks too, because it's kind of like question answering. Imagine like question answering framework, right? If our questions and answers are va like really varying a lot, so I think we can use it for different tasks. Yeah, so basically, even like a question answering, you create. A, okay, so I think the difference between what I understand is if you have like a lot of question answering tasks and you train the model on a lot right. of questions. So, how it is tasks, different from instruction tuning then? It's able to generalize on different question answering tasks, but that right. model is not able to do the summarization, right? Mm, okay. Yeah. But question, so, the question can be also summarization, right? Like, imagine that. Um, that what is the summary of this particular text? Oh, so you are saying if any task we can convert it into the question answering. A question answering, it's right? Able to uh, do the uh, it's able to do the job. So I think yeah. So I think that's what the unified QA is also built on this concept, right? So uh, there are uh, papers that shows that like in when you tune the instruction uh, like with the inst model with the instruction. Actually, it surpasses the performance of the question answering models. So that has been study on that as well. 
so i think i think doing a instruction tuning is very similar to uh, uh to collecting a lot of uh, data and train the model on but when you instruction tune the model i think it's uh, it follows better uh, instruction that even lay person can use right so the point is like even uh, the after the gpt the instruct gpt came the whole purpose of doing the instruct gpt was align them with the human uh, right but i think they are actually instruct gpt the the this collection of the data set was pretty straightforward because they were just collecting it from the communication that they received and their corresponding feedback but if imagine like if we want to do a kind of instruction tuning on an academic environment creating a data set it's itself is a big challenge i don't know what is your motivation yeah so uh, i think there has been now a methods where you can even create right. instruction tune data automatically so you but their can... quality is kind of like still questionable right like it's yeah because... it is still questionable but i think this with the self supervised learning uh, or basically uh, self instruct uh, those are the methods that shows that even creating a instruction tune data synthetically has a, a better performance actually okay so uh yeah i think i think to to uh, answer this question i think you are correct instruction tuning is a type of a uh, supervised learning but i think the goal of instruction tuning is make model more uh, uh, adaptable to follow the instruction in a natural language like how the layman people write and i think make this llm more better uh, in doing so there's some question in the chat as well Yeah. So I think uh, I think it's just a suggestion that yeah. uh, instruction tuning allows the LLM to perform tasks that are written as a uh, natural language instead of a specific needing a specific input, which allows users with all the specific knowledge to use it. So yeah. I have a so quick follow up it. question. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, maybe just man, I thought like fine tuning you to give the input and output, right? And it looks yeah. like in instruction tuning, is it like you give input, output, and some instruction? Yeah. Is so, just... yeah, during the instruction tuning, we have an instruction input as an input and then the uh, corresponding output. Okay. So, this is how, uh, this is the example. Okay. This is how it looks like. So, if you have a question, then, so this is for question generation, answer gen uh, generation task from two different data set. So, this is how instruction looks like. Um, uh, title, definition, uh, emphasis, caution, things to avoid. You have positive, negative example, and then you have a, a lot of task instances. So with the input, you append the instruction, and then uh, you tell model to produce the output. So the key objective you want to learn your model, a mapping between the instruction input and the output. Yeah, uh, I see. I'm doing a course from deep learning. Like there's a short course on, and they they have the same thing that they have positive negative example. And I think that like what's throwing me off is like they didn't call it instruction tuning. So it's just like uh, I'll, I'll send a link to that. It's it's okay. I see. So and you you could have one example or multiple examples, right? It could be. So like... it it depends. Like you can have a mul. So even example choice and in instruction tuning is uh, uh, important. So you can have a multiple positive example. You yeah. can have multiple negative examples. Okay. You can. So you can decide like based on how your task performance is. In uh, so for example, to give you this, uh, give you an answer to this question. If you have a classification task, right? In the classification task, it's better to have at least a one example for each label, then the model understand that okay, like uh, the example for say positive sentiment look like this, neutral sentiment look like this, negative sentiment look like this. Uh, but for a generative task it's uh, okay to have one or two examples where say it's a question answering task then just examples showing that from the context how you, you can answer the question or something like that thank you it depends uh, really on example choices depend really on which task you want to solve or if you are tuning with a lot of instruction uh, tuning task 
then I think you can make a choice for each task separately that how many examples you want to keep. I have one question regarding instruction tuning. Yeah. So um, does the objective remain the same in instruction tuning? Is it like the next sentence prediction or is it different? Uh, no, so objective uh, is different. So basically the objective is uh, uh, how good the expected output is. So, so with, how do you measure that? So usually they me measure at the token level with the cross entropy loss. Okay. Yeah. So if you are predicting all the tokens correctly or not. Okay. But maybe if I if I just mention since they were asked ask this, but they were actually instruction tuning. You can de decide like what kind of um like loss function you want to yeah. use. Cross entropy yeah. loss is the most common one, yeah. Common one, yeah. So you yeah. can decide exactly. So uh, you can have a MSC error if you want if uh your task a uh, set of tasks are like that. So yeah, it's it's also a design choice. But yeah, cross entropy is the common. Yeah, you can also have like a bird similarity score maybe for the output. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so uh, I think it's questions. So uh, should I go ahead or anyone has any more questions? Yes, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So uh, inspiring by the instruction tuning happened in the general domain, um, uh, we also thought like, let's explore the, uh, the instruction tuning uh, efficiency in the biomedical domain. So we come up with the model inbox BART that is instruction tune BART model in the biomedical or clinical domain. So uh, if you want, we have released our model on the hugging fish. We have uh, like it, it, it is a 2022 model. After that, there are many models came out, but I wanted to talk about the, our instruction tuning work in, uh, in this area. And then uh, they have some downloads and this work is basically in top uh, 10 instruction tune, initial uh, instruction tuning works because uh, when the instruction tuning start with flan T0, uh, at that time we also release the inbox part that is I think the pioneering instruction tuning in bio or clinical domain. So now uh, these are my collaborators. Um, so we did this work with ASU Mayo Clinic. Uh, it published in NACL 2022 and uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, inbox part uh, from this point. So before part was getting uh, details about instruction tuning. Now, basically, uh, I'm going to talk about one of uh, our work that uh, has been published in NACL 2022. Okay. Yeah. So what was the motivation uh, while we were doing this work? So first thing is single task model has proven pivotal in solving a specific task, but the overhead is in the real world application, uh, multitasking is necessary. And there has been domain shift as well. So uh, that was the first motivation that can we create a single model that can understand the biomedical instruction in the multitask manner in uh, uh, and 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 solve even even the unseen biomedical uh, biomedical tasks. So and at that time, instructional prompts were have uh, shown us uh, instructional prompt have shown a significant improvement towards multitask generalization in a general domain. So we thought, okay, let's go ahead and let's explore the uh, explore the effect of this instruction tuning in the biomedical domain, where uh, the uh, effect of this instruction prompt and multitask learning has not been very systematically studied at that time. So motivated by this, uh, basically uh, the main goal of our paper was to create a multitask model that can do a multiple clinical task without having a very task specific um, uh, uh, fine tunings. So the approach we used was pretty simple. The approach was collecting a lot of uh, biomedical or clinical tasks and along with the corresponding instructions to those tasks and then tune the model on, uh, on those uh, set of tasks 
and check their uh, ability to to perform on a, a unseen evaluation set so uh, we we started with uh, many tasks these are some example like NER QA uh, systematic review so uh, we have created this biomedical instruction for the each uh, uh, each task along with a set of uh, training samples so in our paper we uh, call this data set the instruction tune data set as a box it's a biomedical NLP across various cat categories where we started uh, we uh, actually collected the different 32 instruction task and uh, we proposed a unified model that can generalize over uh, 32 different biomedical uh, NLP uh, tasks so box box consists of a lot of different categories so we use 29 existing NLP data sets across NER question answering, relation extraction, uh, POS tagging, de-identification, systematic review, uh, document classification, POS tagging, risk factor identification. So uh, some of these data sets are uh, from the N2C2 challenge. Uh, for question answering, we use the PubMed Q and Bio, Bio Ask Q. And for NER, we used all the biomedical and clinical publicly available data set for uh, different uh, type of uh, entities. And uh, yeah, so this is this is basically our uh, task collection. So for each of this data set and each of this task, we have manually uh, created uh, instructions. So instruction, I'll also tell what kind of instruction schema that we have used and uh, we, form each of the tasks as text-to-text -text task because we want to train a text generation model. So the key part we did is converting all the tasks into text-to-text -text, into text -text format. And uh, yeah, and then we have a human authored high quality biomedical instruction for all the uh, 32 tasks created from this 29 data sets. So our instruction schema were pretty simple. So this is this what our instruction schema look like. So for each uh, particular task that we have in the box, we have introduced a biomedical instruction where we have a definition. So definition is essentially contains the core explanation about the task and the detailed instruction to model like what needs to be done. If it's any ER task, then it's all about basically uh, extracting the particular entity types. You want this format, you want these things uh, uh, in, in your output. For question answering, it's a simple definition like, okay, uh, this is the context and this is the question your job or your task is to answer the question and you provide some examples. So, uh, and prompt, we also use the prompt to have a short explanation of the task that needs to be done. Because there are two things we want model to understand. One, if someone provides a very detailed instruction and say, okay, this needs to be done or a simplest instruction that, okay, summarize this. So basically the short version of the, the long, long instruction. So that's why we have both the things, definition and prompt uh, in our instruction. Then we have examples. So example contains input output pairs along with the explanations. Explanation telling that why for this particular input, this output makes sense. So, and then the final is the instances. So there are a lot of instances uh, with the input output pairs for the training purposes of the model. This is kind of a one uh, example instruction for the NER task. You can see here the definition uh, says that, okay, you are, you need to extract the chemical organism, protein, regular operant entities from the context. And then it also provides a format, generate the output in a particular format where you have an entity and in the angular bracket, you have a uh, you have a type of entity. So Sorry, Nehe, one thing I probably missed it. So what is the huh? base model that you are using? Uh, BART. Okay, so that is actually trained on PubMed data, right? Oh, no, BART is a train on the uh, general domain data, actually. So you are not using the bioclinical BART or something that uh, it's actually general domain data you are currently just using on biomedical domain? Yeah, so we, we uh, yeah, we are not using the model pre-train on the biomedical domain because we also wanted to uh, see that like if you use the general domain pre-train model, and just do the instruction tuning, how well the model able to generalize. Uh, 
uh, on this domain specific data. Okay, okay, yeah. got it. Because since you are using the named entity recognition task, that's why I asked that um, how much your vocabulary actually overlaps. Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, so all the tasks that we have used, a uh, set of tasks that we had, like all these are from the uh, for the instruction tuning. These are from the um, uh, biomedical slash clinical domain. Okay. Yeah. Because, okay, okay, got it. Because I would be really interested to understand, particularly for your name identity recognition task, uh -huh. how much your vocabulary overlaps with your base vocabulary, like okay. base model vocabulary before fine tuning. Yeah, so uh, I think we haven't particularly proposed, uh, like, uh, had any study there to showcase that. But uh, the base model that we have used is the BART model, which is trained on the general domain data and not any specific biomedical clinical data. Okay. Yep. And uh, then uh, we provide like uh, one example. So it's basically, this is the input, this is the output and why this particular thing, uh, particular output is associated with this input. And then we just collect the task. Task is the input output pair. So uh, task instances is just input output pair where we did not have any explanation or any other thing. So uh, only the example instances have the explanation that are human uh, authored and uh, none of these instructions at this point are automatically generated. So, uh, yeah, and now, so this is the problem setup. And I think where, uh, so let's assume we have, a, so this is a, uh, basically the problem setup between the single task learning where you have the supervised learning for a task specific instances. And then you have the instruction tuning where you try to map the model to understand the instruction and input with the output. So say, we have a pair of input instance xt and yt given a task t and along with that you have a uh, instruction that i annotated as a bit so so single task models are basically learn a mapping function between the input and output and uh, they are basically trained on evaluated on the same task so this is a uh, simple problem setting that we do in machine learning or deep learning where you have a label data with the input and output and then you train the model on the, uh, that particular task and that you evaluate the model on that uh, particular same task. So if you have a 32 task, then we have created like a 32 single task model where you just train the model on one particular data set and evaluate on that same distribution so evaluate on the same uh, data set. Then we have a multitask model with instruction where you learn a mapping function between the input and output and biomedical instruction that are trained com on combined data of all of tasks along with the instruction. And then we evaluate it on the individual task where the evaluation set uh, doesn't have any overlap with the, uh, uh, with the train set. We also uh, had a one more setting that I think I haven't mentioned here, where we do the multitask without instruction, where you just have a tag for each uh, data set that this is the NER task, or this is the systematic review task, this is the question answering task. You combine all the possible data without uh, instruction, and then you train the model uh, on that all combined data and that you evaluate on the individual task where you don't have any overlap with the training set. So we have actually, we had actually three settings where uh, we train even the model without instructions. So uh, we use the BART model for the experiment. So we designed like two baselines, a uh, single task model where each model is trained on each data set and the multitask model without instruction, which is a vanilla box BART where there is no instruction tuning happening. It's just collecting all the data, train the model, and then evaluate the model. So uh, the proposed model is basically a fine-tuned model, fine-tuned BART model on this combined instruction metadata set, which we essentially call the uh, inbox BART model. Then, uh, so key, some key parts are uh, instance selection. 
So at that time, we have discarded all the instances with more than 1024 token length because during the training, uh, the limit of the BART model at a time, it can only take the 1024 highest token limit. So uh, we have actually from the training set to remove the noise, we have just selected the instances for the training, which falls within the uh, certain token length. Uh, the example selection, as the previous question asked. So uh, we have discarded all the example from the instruction tuning associated with the classification task, especially because some of this classification task has a long input. And if we feed the uh, example for all the possible class where there for a document classification, there are possible, uh, it's a multi-class classification. The combination of possible classes are more. And if we give all the possible example, it's not able to fit into the training uh, token length. And if we keep certain examples for the classification, what happens in the uh, during the instruction tuning is with those classification example, the model tend to get biased towards a particular class and then just predicting that particular uh, 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 class during the inference time. So uh, in the classification task, it's advised that you have all the possible example for all of your class. Otherwise, if you don't have examples, uh, if you have more classes, then model tends to perform better. So we have empirically uh, made this uh, design choice of the example selection. Uh, then um, we, for the instance sampling during the training time for the classification task, we have created the balanced data set. So if there is a very skewed distribution, especially in the systematic review task where include exclude instances have a very skewed uh, distribution, we applied some sampling techniques before using the data set to create uh, instruction tuning data set. So sampling techniques were uh, very simple. We have used the uh, up sampling or down sampling. So where there is a lot of skewness, like 90% uh, skewness, where only 10% are one class, 90% are the other class. We down sample from the uh, majority class and we up sample the uh, uh, minority class. So uh, we created the balanced data set so that this models during at least the training, uh, they learn better. At the evaluation time, we did not have any sampling or any selection techniques. So when you say sampling, hey, so you are are you talking about sampling of the tokens or you are talking about sampling of um the instance itself? Oh no, no, I am talking about the sampling of instances. How do you know that um without looking at the output, what would be the sampling of the instances? Oh no, this is this is during the training time. So that uh, the so you looked at all the thirty two class that you are trying and all the instances for sampling. Uh no. So we only looked at the classification tasks where okay uh, because you are also using for instruction tuning. Also, you are using cross entropy, right? Like we can actually think everything is actually a classification task. Yeah, we can think everything is a classification task. But uh, why we did, especially, especially for the classification task is, if the classes are very skewed in the classification data set, then the behavior of model kind of get biased by those uh, uh, classes. So that's why like we use the sampling technique for the classification data set to make them actually balance. But for the generative task, even though you are using the cross entropy, that would be not the problem, right? Because in the generative task, uh, you Yeah, have... that's what I was thinking, right? Like Because I thought that you are doing the sampling on the token level itself, not for every task. Yeah. So that's why the generative level, the really balancing doesn't really help, right? Even yes, since yes. It's, yeah. But for the classification, you require okay. that. Otherwise, it gives a very skewed result. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then we also analyze the uh, few shot settings where we analyze the performance of inbox part by varying number of our training examples where uh, we started with just training with the 32 instances and we reached to the full data set. So this is kind of a uh, experimental setup. Uh, evaluation metric at this point, we use two different evaluation metric, RUGEL and app score. So RUGEL is basically for a generative task and app score is mainly for the classification task. Um, so RUGEL is used for mainly question answering and all 
uh, uh, POS tagging and all those tasks. But app score is basically all systematic review, document classification, uh, all the classification tasks. So uh, results is basically a single task model, vanilla box but and inbox but achieves on an average uh, rule gel of this respectively. Uh, at this point, I'm showing this in terms of um, uh, uh, rule L uh, to give a better understanding. So uh, the key part we observed here is, although there is a uh, same complexity between a vanilla box but uh, but uh, uh, it inbox but significantly outperforms the vanilla box but by 17 point uh, like almost 18 percent across all average across all the tasks and it also outperforms the single task but a small uh, with a small margin when you use the entire data set but what we observed is when you do the few short learning where you just have, say, imagine for each task, you have only 32 label instances. You don't have um, uh, any more. So at that point, we observed a very big gap. So when you have the only few instances and you create a supervised model, even a task specific model, it's not able to uh, do that of a good job on an average. But if you have an instruction tune model and you train even with the few shot, 32 instances, the model is tend to perform uh, much better compared to the single task model. So that was also one uh, thing we observed is that at least in instruction tune models are quick learner. So you have even a few set of label instances, but if you have a proper instruction tuning uh, task, uh, you are able to achieve the better performance on every single task rather than having a supervised single task model. Um, and the key part is obtaining a large annotated data set in biomedical is difficult, time consuming and costly. So at that time, like uh, this few shot study was very uh, helpful. And we say that, oh, instruction tuning is good. When you have a few number of label instances, you can create a lot many tasks with a few number of label instances and then train a model and able to achieve a good uh, accuracy on um, uh, on a different, uh, different tasks. So this was like our uh, finding in a nutshell. There were there were other analysis that we did, like for which task uh, biomedical instructions are more helpful. So we observe that like uh, at least a baseline uh, for five categories: NER, de-identification, uh, relation extraction, systematic review, and risk factor identification. For these five categories, uh, the instruction tuning were more helpful, where output were more formatted and uh, more correct. Uh, other categories, uh, there were uh, instruction tuning find it very complex uh, to produce the better output. So uh, then we also observed which are harder tasks to solve with uh, uh, biomedical instruction. So task that includes either a multi-class scenarios or basically uh, uh, answer generation from the context are most likely to be harder. But I think the still the multi-class scenario is still the problem, but answer generation have been solved with many new models that came out, including MedPalm and Alpaga Care. So they have focused on instruction tuning specifically for a generative task where you have to generate a complex answer from the context. So there have been studied came out after this, but um, uh, still the multi-class scenario is not completely solved. Uh, for which task BI are more beneficial in few shot setting? So similarly, like uh, NER, de-identification, QN sentiment analysis, and risk factor identification, those tasks actually shows on an average larger improvements, uh, even with a few shot setting where you have only hundreds or uh, even less than 100 annotated instances. There are some discussion over it that can we design a better instruction? So uh, I think this has been also been studied uh, now with a big bio and all uh, these benchmarks where if you have a domain specific information rich instruction, it can improve the model performance further. Uh, so this has been still a, a, a key long-standing problem how to handle the long context input. 
there have been models now with gpt4 and all where you can feed like a 40k or even with gemini a million tokens at a time but it doesn't mean that these models are able to understand the million tokens so how to handle the long context input is still a challenge uh, uh, even with the instruction tune model or even with the prompting model and uh, yeah as i said how to handle the multi class classification task that is also a still challenging for uh, this kind of instruction model so these are i think uh, some areas that uh, even this uh, uh, second and third area that i am also exploring at this point about solving the long context problem in uh, in uh, medical domain so if anyone interested also i'm happy to take this discussion offline and see if someone is want to collaborate on this or not and uh, final conclusions are basically uh, this research shows the impact of instruction in multitask learning setting in the biomedical domain we introduced the box uh, which led to build many other benchmarks in future which is in, which includes the big bio as well uh, we propose a inbox bot uh, uh that shows the improved performance over simple multitask tuning and the single task tuning and uh our approach actually shows that in instruction tuning has potential uh in a low resource setting where you have a you have a small annotated data set and um uh, data set where creating a single task model is uh quite difficult so yeah so with this i'll conclude my presentation and i'm happy to uh, go ahead with the with the discussion thank you so much me for a wonderful uh, presentation and uh, on that note please we would like to give the audience a round of virtual applause to mehir for such a good presentation so uh, are there any more questions Okay, so on that note, uh, Mihir, I wanted to ask a question. So, uh, like you uh, did all these ex uh, experiments with BART, B A R T BART. Uh, did you at any point in time consider working with T five models because they are essentially all these encoder decoder models? Yeah, so uh, I think yes, but but the. Thing but is, I think it's a little bit larger than BART. So that's the reason because a larger model kind of, uh, why I'm asking this is because larger model can help you kind of, uh, uh, like it kind of allows a larger context length, which gives you a little bit more of wiggle room if you are making your instructions or something. That's the only, yeah, my concern. Yeah. On this, yeah. On this so uh, I think this, uh, this question is two part answers. So uh, first answer is, uh bart model allows more freedom okay. in terms of using the uh, uh in terms of generation capabilities t5 has a very specific formats and tagging that you have yes. to use so that yeah. was the one more reason we want to uh check the performance of the model where the you have a more generation freedom and you don't it, you can write things in nature language rather than having a specific tagging format like uh, t5 has that summarization tags and all mm -hmm. this things that you have to take so t5 has trained in a certain way uh a pre-trained in a certain way so that we chose uh bart over t5 other thing is um that was at the base and large model t5 has the another versions as well uh 3 billion and 11 billion models mm. so t5 yes. has even the larger uh, scale yeah. but uh honest answer at that time we did not have that much of resources to okay. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, train a billion models because LLM okay. was starting coming in and uh, in terms of when 2022 when we did this work uh, there was a resource constraint as well okay so that's why we did not explore that okay. but after that point like many people have used box or then the big bio came uh, box was the part yeah. of big bio collection okay. and then with that big bio people have train a uh, different model like even big bio has been used in alpaca care so yeah. uh like all this model it's, it's some portion actually not entirely but some portion so then alpaca care came out then uh med pump came out really we don't know like what yeah. is um, yeah. a med pump training set but yeah. then the med pump came out and um all these models have uh already 
been started surpass yeah. so at yeah. that point although we have a resources now we haven't explored the yeah. other models okay like makes sense because right now with gemini or chat gpt they have already trained on this data set so that kind of gives me the segue to go on to the next question so the next question is uh, say for example you have here looked at encoder decoder models but there's another model i'm pretty sure you know it's called gpt neo yeah, or GPT -J. GPT yeah, GPT J. Yeah, GPT J. So GPT J, GPT Neo, these class of models, they have been trained on the pile data set. And the yeah. pile data set essentially contains all these biomedical data sets that you have trained on for your instruction, that you have used for your instruction tuning. How do you think the performance improvement would happen if we kind of have a data set, have a model that has been pre-trained on these publicly available data sets, and then we are using instruction tuning to kind of uh make it more instruction tuned like you're getting what i'm trying to say right like yeah so yeah. i think i think it will further push the performance okay. uh, on those particular uh, uh task especially yeah. it also uh, if it's pre-trained on a lot of uh, even pile is a very big data set yeah right? exactly yeah. pre-train on the yes. pile data set yeah it's uh i think uh if we further instruction tune these models yeah their capability of following the instruction at least will improve. Okay. So performance on even the unseen uh, biomedical or clinical task yeah. might go up. Okay. That was what my question was. Do you think that they will go up on unseen data set? Because probably they might be overfitting on the data set that you have used or the data set that is yeah. already out because there. Because I but, think yeah. now these data sets are already have been part of many pre-training sets as well, I guess. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Now I'm pretty sure with all these really very large language models, uh, nothing, no data on the internet is private anymore. So every, I think they have already been trained on this. Yeah, I'm not of, sure about N2C2 because N2C2 yeah. data is private. You yeah, I think you have to need, you need, a, yeah. you need but an But for all other, the publicly access, available yeah. data set we have used, I think yeah. those uh, can be the part of pre-training now. Okay, okay. Yeah, any more questions? Thank you so much. So any more questions from the audience? Uh, last comment from myself. Mahit, do you see this more of as a framework where you can basically plug in whatever new LLM comes in, given enough resources and can uh, generate a better model for a uh, variety of tasks? Or like, do you think it is specific to the model, the LLM that you are using? No, I think it's a framework. So you can plug in. So apart from BART, even you can use the same data set and train a GPT Neo. Mm -hmm. And I think now uh, uh, after this, the instruction tune uh, uh, field has been also progressed a lot. So there are a lot of uh, new paper came out like uh, self-instruct or uh, Tarzan with the targeted data generation. Uh, there is a re recently in ACL, there is a paper called reflection tuning. So that is a further um, uh, uh, further part of the instruction tuning. So reflection tuning makes the instruction tuning better as well. So there are a lot of new things also came out. So I think I looked at this as a, as a framework where, you know, now even like on a box, you can apply a self-instruct kind of methodology, create a lot of synthetic data, and then plug into any other model to train a or keep training the your instruction tuning model to make it better and better. Thank you very much. Uh, if sorry, I was muted. So if there are no more questions, thank you so much. And thank you, Meher, for such an awesome and engaging uh, presentation. And uh, with that, I will please I will ask the audience to again give me here another round of applause virtual applause and with that i will end the presentation and the talk thank you so much Mini. okay thank you thank you thank for you. inviting yeah bye bye